God has brought me to Ecclesiastes today. And the reason he's brought me here, as I understand it, is he's trying to shape my perspective. You know, I'm going through something that I've been talking about, this transition of sorts from what I once had to just chiseling down and living on what he's given me until I'm done here, until I'm done doing what he has me doing. And I have to trust him that this is going, that something's going to happen. I mean, even if it's not what I think I was supposed to live on and it's getting down to the wire. And what I see him doing is he's still talking to me. He's still talking with me and he's letting me know these are the things I have done. So he's not giving me the answers that I'm asking him for. Like, what are you going to do? You know, when is this going to happen? When is something going to happen? He's not giving me those answers, but he is talking with me dealing with me on certain things, and then also reminding me of what he's done and who he is. Not even necessarily like, look what I've done to take care of you financially. Not even like that, but more of, you know, what it kind of reminds me of is when Jesus healed the blind man and the Pharisees were giving him a hard time and they were saying, who is this that forgives sins? Because he says you are forgiven. And he said, what's easier for me to say that your sins are forgiven or for me to heal? Oh, excuse me. I think it was the man on the mat that he said, get up, get up and walk. And so he was demonstrating something. And it's kind of kind of reminds me of that, what he's doing, where he's saying, look at what I did. I gave you eyes to see. And then what you thought could be impossible, I gave others eyes to see what I gave you to see. I testified to what you were saying, even though it's complete madness to the world. I gave your daughter eyes to see, and now I'm activating her in the role for which I set her apart, and she's leading the body in certain ways. She's understanding in ways you couldn't have controlled. What's easier, to save or to simply provide? And it's a pretty profound thing for him to say to me, and yet ever so many minutes I'm sitting here going yeah but Lord three to four months that's what I have that's what I have so then he reminds me that you know when Tori was pregnant with Jeremiah they had told her if you get to 42 weeks that's really high risk we have to go in and get him and I think she was somewhere in you know like around 35 weeks when they said that and she said to me I think God's going to have me go to 42 weeks I think he's going to test me. And she went to 42 weeks and one day. And one day. So I think he's going to make me go to 42 weeks and one day. You know, metaphorically. He's got me up against that wall, but he wants to reveal his glory. And my, my daughter said to me the other day, I enjoyed postpartum so much. <laughs> Who says that, right? I enjoyed postpartum so much. I mean, obviously you're enjoying your baby. But one of the things I was reflecting on is, yeah, God brought us so low. I mean, we were at our breaking point. My daughter was calling me hysterical. Is God going to require me to sacrifice my own child, my firstborn son? I mean, he brought her through a real Abraham moment, but he had to break that stronghold of us trusting in medicine for so many years. He had to break it. And everything that they said, in fact, you know, what they said was true. The the placenta was calcified. Uh, all of the things, I, I didn't realize that actually initially when I looked at the placenta, I didn't think it was, and then the kids told me it was. So all of those things that they had said to her were true, and yet God defied everything. He brought a healthy baby boy with more energy than I could ever hope for, a healthy mother who wasn't butchered by being cut open, or given poisons or anything else. But we all had to trust. And But in the weeks leading up to that, we were all like, we would just get to the wall. And then we'd be like, okay, like, like we were like dripping off the wall, you know? And you know what I was doing? Because I was taking you through it. Every time that I would get to that point of like, I'm, I'm breaking, I, I don't know what else to do. I would just get in the word and read. I'd read about delivery. I'd read about faith. 
and perseverance. I'd read about the name that God made for himself, him delivering the Israelites and putting all of those plagues on the Egyptians and then relenting and then bringing it and then relenting and then bringing it again. And I would just try to remind myself of who he is. So that's kind of really what I'm doing today. I asked him to make me stand. I asked him to bring me into the perspective that I need to be in. And this is where he led me. And I'll tell you something. I'm not super familiar with Ecclesiastes. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I get an opportunity to be familiar with it, but I wouldn't have known to go here. He brought me here. And so as he was breaking us leading up to Jeremiah's delivery, we were so in the spirit, me, Ness, Tori, so in the spirit, like we had been so broken that when our grief turned to joy, all we could do was praise God. Like his glory was so evident and so strong. His power was made great in our weakness and we knew that he was God. And isn't that what he says over and over in the word? You're going to know when I bring these things, you're going to know that I am the Lord. You are going to see my glory. You are going to know that I am the Lord God and that I do whatever I want. How many times does he say that in the Bible and we just pass by it and kind of go, okay, we'll know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without even really acknowledging the heart of God that he wants us to revere him and know who he is and believe in him and believe in who he has said that he is and the promises that we keep staking everything on like he wants us to really actually believe it he does not want us to just wait out our time here like wicked and lazy servants we have to be brought into a position of truly knowing who he is and that is why her postpartum period was so incredible because i mean you know when you go through that it's like Every second of the day, you're just constantly praising him and holding that precious baby boy and saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for bringing him to delivery. You didn't have to, but you did. And you realize what a miracle that is and that only God could do that. So I know that that's what he's doing with me right now. And he's wanting for me to get my perspective correct and I also know that God relents once I've learned the lesson. So I don't know. The thing is, we don't know what the lesson is until he takes us deeper and then he, you know, teaches us part of the lesson and then he takes us deeper yet again. And that's definitely what he's doing with me. Ecclesiastes 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, and utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, where they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear, its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Now remember what God gave Solomon. He gave him incredible wisdom so that he saw things that other people could not see. So in verse 14, it says, I have seen all the things that are under the sun, all of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. 
I said to myself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. This is real wisdom that Solomon has. I mean, he had everything. He had everything. He had understanding. He had wives and money and wealth and whatever it was, whatever he needed. And yet you're going to hear what he has to say. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what's good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during a few days of their lives. So this is what comes to mind for me, which is, you know, present right now, ever present right now is this death of Matthew Perry, who made really good money on that show Friends. In fact, I had heard someplace that they made like a million dollars per episode. And there were a lot of episodes. So this is a person who had incredible wealth and admittedly was in active addiction, was lonely, could not recover, did not have an identity, and came to a very, very sad death. And it's so interesting and totally not something that I could have put together how God is speaking to me today through that, which is all over the media right now, bringing me to Ecclesiastes, showing me who I've been, and showing me the stronghold that he's rooting out right now. He won't answer me. He won't answer me about these things that I want to put, you know, that my flesh wants to naturally, you know, and rationally say, okay, I have enough money in my account. Now I can rest. He does not want me resting in that. He wants me resting in him. Everything meaningless. He loves me and he's showing me what's meaningful. And it is so hard because the flesh just wants to take that back and and say, yeah, I trust you, but only if there's enough money in my account. That's a lie. Only if there's enough money in my account to back up what you're doing. That's not trust if I need to subsidize or back up who he has promised himself to be. Oh, it's so hard. I understand it, but it's so hard to just get it into my heart. It's not like, you know, it was easier when I had like a year to live on or something like that. When you have a few months to live on, it is so hard. And I'm not talking about a few months while you have income coming in. I'm talking about a few months, period. It's so hard. But I'm sharing it with you because this is where he's brought me. And it's important to him. And if it's important to him, it should be important to me. And it should be important to you because this isn't just a crisis for me to overcome. This is what God is doing to show, to reveal his heart and his glory. So he says, laughter is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. Okay, don't don't act like you don't know what this is. He was building his own house here, okay? He just got done saying, I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. This is what people, what all of us have tried to do. Oh, well, I'm going to remodel this and that'll, that's going to make me feel better, right? I'm redoing my garden. I'm adding on to my house. These are the things that we do during the few days of our lives, thinking this is going to bring me satisfaction. This is going to bring me fulfillment. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself 
and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became great, greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was my reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all the, that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. I identify with this so much, and I've been having these thoughts in my mind you know, ever so often that pop up and then I've got to like come against them and, you know, restructure and restructure my heart. But I've been having these thoughts of like, oh, I, you know, I, I blew through my wealth. It was just so dumb. Like I, you know, it wasn't like I lived outside of my means, but I, I, I spent money stupidly. You know, I was irresponsible, not in the sense of living outside of my means, but within my means, I spent money on stupid stuff is what I'm saying. I could have remodeled this and I could have remodeled that and I could have done this and I could have done that, right? And so I've been noticing that that my heart starts going back there and I start thinking about all the things I could have done with that wealth as though that would change how I feel today. How far does God have to bring a fool like me to understand that all of that is meaningless? That I would go back in my heart to think if only I had that wealth again, I'd make these other choices. Why am I still going there? Why am I still going there, guys? And this is what God's showing me today because this is what I asked him. Bring this stuff up and out of me. Make me clean. Give me the perspective that you have. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done. I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then, what then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. The thing that the Holy Spirit's raising for me right now is everything that you work for here in this life, everything I've worked for here in this life will be left to someone else, but the things I've worked for in heaven. And so it reminds me of what Jesus says, don't store up for yourself treasures here, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's hard because we can't see it. We can't grasp it. But if we can understand that much, then we must work our hearts into that. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. Wow. I'm going to read it again. To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. Wow, wow, wow. While we're suffering, while we're looking around and seeing how easy life is for the wicked, just remember that everything they have will be given to one who has, so that the one who has will be given more. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. 
a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been and whatever has been before and God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun in the place of judgment Wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place, all come from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was, taken pla that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead, who had already died, are happier than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and ruin th themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Better a poor but wise youth than, old, than an old but foolish king who no longer knows to heed a warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born into poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them, but those who came later were not pleased with this successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. I want to read that again because this is something I tell you guys all the time. You have to bring yourself to God correctly. You cannot multiply your words against God. You cannot burst into his presence. You cannot engage him in idle chatter. You need to be meaningful and you need to have taken the time 
to examine what's in your heart before going to him or you're going to go to him with filth in your heart. You have to bring yourself into a position just like Esther did with King Ahasuerus. And that position is not a physical position. It's not a mental position. It is a heart position. And then that heart position is going to affect your physical position and your mental position, isn't it? Because think about it for a moment. When you're humble, when you're in a position of humility and you're returning to him in that posture, your physical posture changes, doesn't it? But why does your physical posture change? Does it change because you decided to hunch yourself or to lower your head? No, your physical posture changes because that's what's in your heart. And this is where your seal or the mark of the beast is in your heart. It's what's going to come out of your right hand, your deeds, your forehead, the way you think, and your mouth, the way you speak, the things you're saying. So how can you go to God in the flesh and think that this is an outside in job when you haven't even done what you need to do in your heart? You have to bring yourself into that position. That's what Heart Known Series helps you to do. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you're on earth. So let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your, your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by, an, by a higher one. And over both them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Oh, that is true. No rest for the wicked, okay? I mean, in all the people that I've seen who kept telling me, I have insomnia, I have anxiety, I have PTSD, that is the issue. Insomnia, when you are not able to rest, it's because you're not entering God's rest. It's a physical manifestation of what's going on in your heart and spirit. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoard, hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil and they can carry, that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun. During the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. I have seen another evil under the sun and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so that they lack nothing in, nothing their de hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them. Yes, that's true. And strangers enjoy them in set, instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. Oy. That makes me just realize my filth. But that's absolutely the truth. Great wealth, no financial security. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like financial security is not something that necessarily comes from wealth. It's never enough. You're always looking over your shoulder and the vultures come to pick the meat off your carcass. <laughs> Everybody wants a piece of you. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, 
If he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place? Everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a person in life? During the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow, who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone? A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Ooh, yes. You know, a while ago we had someone who uh, came to an assembly and they were really trash-talking the people in the assembly and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And there were people who were in mourning in the assembly because that's what God's people are in. Hello? No one's, like, living their best life here. And the person was uh, giving advice that was, you know, from the occult and, you know, talking about, oh, you can create with God and, you know... That, that you don't need to be in this state and blah, blah, blah. And the thing that they were, they were bothered by the fact that God's people are in mourning. They, they couldn't handle that. And I had made a video about, you know, bubbly, like I wasn't talking about her, but I was talking about bubbliness being phony, being fake. It's not real. And so many people find that comforting to be around a bubbly, you know, toxically positive person. But if you're living in reality, if you're in Christ, you're suffering with him. You're suffering in this world. You're grieved by what's going on in Jerusalem, not not the physical land of Jerusalem, in his church. You're grieved by that and you're in a state of mourning most of the time. And you're always looking at what would you like me to do, Lord? Not what am I going to go make up that I'm going to do, which is far too common in counterfeit Christianity. Only God can tell you where he wants you to go and what he set you apart to do. But you also realize as you're doing the Lord's work but that you have no power. Like he is concurrently demonstrating his glory through the objects of his wrath to the objects of his mercy. He's constantly demonstrating to the objects of his mercy what they could have been what they could have been destined for so that we're always in this position of humility and gratitude, but also grief because we're few. We are so few in this world. And that person got really triggered by my video, like admitted that I, they knew I wasn't talking about them, but they got super triggered by it and, and ranted on me. The wicked cannot accept this way of life. That's my point. They can't accept that this is the truth in Christ. If you are living your best life and you are bubbly and laughing all the time and it's so easy to suffer with Christ, it's so easy to be Christian. I don't think so, guys. I don't think so. That's not what the word says. The word says, pick up your cross, come follow him, sell everything that you have, give to the poor it's hard for a rich uh, for a rich man to be saved. It's hard for the righteous to be saved. That's what the word says. Come suffer with Christ. Share in the sufferings of Christ. You've not yet resisted sin to the point of shedding your blood. You've not yet, key word, resisted sin to the point of shedding your own blood. The word says that those going up in the first resurrection will be martyrs and those who've been given authority to judge. Like how does counterfeit Christianity fit themselves into those categories? 
Well, they don't even, they're not even aware of those categories that they exist in the Bible because they're too busy listening to man. Here's what the word says. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Oh no, but God wants me to be joyful. He wants me to be joyful. That was the response. Do you understand what joy is in the Lord? You understand what gives him joy? It's not the, the, the pleasures of the flesh. Those who are doing these things, they're going to choke on their joy and their bubbliness. It will become a stumbling block for them. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. <laughs> Amen. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool and bri a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? Well, I'm sorry. I really got to bring my heart right. So these thoughts don't even creep in for it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the ad advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. The righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than 10 rulers in a city. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I tested by wisdom and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever exists is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate and search out wisdom and the schemes of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the schemes of things, while I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. I'm going to stop there. I really am enjoying Ecclesiastes, but I don't want to make the video too long because I know that um, can be difficult for some people to be able to listen um, thank you for coming along with me on this study. I hope you'll discern these things with God.